Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us live. We're watching the recording later. Uh, welcome to our fifth week as we move through this spring season of the Beth Bond Memorial Book Club and we journey through the book Refugia Faith, Seeking Hidden Shelters, Ordinary Wonders, and the Healing of the Earth by our good friend Deborah Ringstra. Uh, this week is not our last week of book club. This next week, Deborah herself will be joining us live. And so we're very much looking forward to that where you will get a chance to interact with her, ask her your questions, tell her your comments and concerns you have. Um, she's going to join us live and I can't wait to do that. Uh, this week, however, it is our last time working through content from the book. We're finishing with chapters six and seven from passivity to citizenship and from indifference to attention. So as is our custom, I will open us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to start in scripture. So if you want to meet me in the gospel account of Mark, that is the gospel account of Mark in the first chapter, you can just turn right to the first page, unroll that scroll, that codex. We're going to meet in Mark 1. That's where we'll spend our time. I'm going to try to give you more time in breakout groups today because I know there are two chapters. So I want to try to give you a full 30 minutes today. I will do my best to condense down a little bit of the context and framing for today. Uh, so with that, I'll open us in prayer. We'll dive into Mark 1, and then we will go out to our breakout groups. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and the good news that is your son, Jesus the Christ. We thank you for the good news of the work that was done on the cross as we sit here in this time of Lent where we turn our attention to and reflect on the work of the cross. Lord, we thank you for the good news that what we see around us is not all that there is, that there is more to come, and that you will provide a true day of justice and restoration and reconciliation. So as we sit in this already time waiting for the not yet, Lord, we just seek to do your will and see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. We do all this in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, let's jump right in. And as a reminder, for those of you that haven't been able to be live with us for each week, or you've been catching some of the recordings, I want to catch us up to where we are at the end of the book. We started very early on talking about kinship and healing, and we looked at the passage in John 5 where Jesus heals. And, and we talked about this idea that maybe sometimes in our own lives, whether it's dealing with the climate crisis or other of our lives, what we're looking for is ritual. We're looking for something, something to do to fix our lives. And when that maybe doesn't do it, we might turn to a re religion, not just capital R religion, but a way of life seeking change. Ultimately, what Jesus is calling us into, as we saw in that passage and throughout the gospel, is relationship. Uh, Jesus says that he is the way to the Father. Um, and so what we're looking for, or what we kind of get when it comes to kinship and healing, is maybe the opposite of what sometimes we are looking for. We get relationship with Jesus, and that transforms the way we live our lives, and then that transforms how we act. In our, in our lives. And so we really want to be focusing on that relationship piece. And then we took another step forward and we talked about lament and why it's so hard sometimes for us to lament. We looked in the Hebrew Bible at the book of Lamentations and that question of how, how God, how did things get so bad and so broken? And that God's response to lament, or as Deborah talks about in the book, taking our grief to God is one way we can describe lament, grief taken to God, and that when we do that, when we lament and we repent, we turn, that God has an ultimate plan for restoration. And we looked at that through the lens of both the Hebrew Bible and what Jesus has to say about himself in that new creation. And we looked at some of Paul's work on that as well. And last week, uh, just as recently as last week, we looked at this idea of gratitude 
and we opened up Colossians and we looked at uh, chapter three, verse 15 through 17. And specifically, we looked at that word uh, grace or charis and, and how the word grace is active in this ultimate response to being raised with Christ is gratitude or grace. And that's that word that we kind of saw there when we looked underneath the hood of English and, and kind of got to the, the Greek that was there that Paul was writing. And we look at this idea of grace. And so today, what I'd like to do with our time as we're looking at citizenship and attention is go to the gospel account of Mark. I think what we're going to find are a couple interesting things just to kind of bring all of this home and close out our time. So we've talked about relationship and relationship with Jesus uh, transforming us and restoring us. And so what I want us to see today when we get through this passage in Mark is that through that restoration, there is a call for a response. And so just to set it up, Mark is a gospel account. It's found in the New Testament. That's one of those four uh, uh, records of, of Jesus's earthly ministry. The gospel of Mark really is the, 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 the action beats, right? It moves quickly. A lot is happening in Mark. Every time you turn around, he's changing the setting or the characters at the setting or what's happening in the ministry. So it's moving really, really quickly. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time in Mark 14 and 15. But just to note that I, I actually think there's something interesting that opens up the gospel of Mark. It's not the point of the talk today. I do encourage you to get a cup of coffee or tea or go on a walk and think about this though. Uh, the gospel of Mark opens mirroring Genesis, right? It opens with the beginning or in Genesis opens in the beginning. So the beginning of the gospel, the euvangelion, that's that word there about Jesus Christ, the son of God. So there's a big, bold claim here right at the outset. Uh, it's that this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the announcement. And that announcement is about Jesus. And most of you all here know this already. Christ is not his last name. That's a title. He's the Messiah, the anointed one. So there is a claim already that this good news is about this Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Messiah, but more than just the Messiah, he is the son of God. So that's how the gospel opens. And then we get a quick succession of stories here of the baptism and the temptation. And then we get to where we find ourselves today in verse 14. So I'm just going to read a couple of quick passages here. Uh, uh, I'm going to read actually down to 18, but we're going to focus in on 14 and 15. So this is what scripture says in Mark 1, verse 14. After John, that would be the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. So there we see good news again. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. There's good news again. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake where they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Okay, so what's going on? There's a lot to unpack here. And again, I encourage you in your spare time to look at those different uses of the good news and how many times it populates that text in those first 18 verses. Um, some of you might be familiar with this tool. We use it a lot at the church that I get to serve at. It's the learning circle, the Kairos uh, circle. It's, it's a tool developed by 3DM. Some of you might have seen this. And essentially what this tool helps us do is unpack something important. And that's this Kairos moment. I read in verse 14 and 15 that Jesus announces when he gets into Galilee and starts preaching, the time has come. Now, I'm not going to go into the Greek today and pull out the interlinear, but what's important to know is that that word time that we have in English is really the Greek word kairos. And there are a couple different ways that you can talk about time. There are a couple options that Mark had when he was writing this in the Greek. He could have used the word chronos or 
chronological time, right? This idea of moment after moment kind of preceding and anteceding each other. But he uses this different word for time, which is kairos. It's this pregnant moment. It's this important moment. It's this moment that is not so much about sequential moments after moment, but about special purpose. And what Jesus says when he steps in is that in this special moment, this special moment has come. And in this special moment, the kingdom of God has arrived. It's near. You can reach out and touch it. And so with the kingdom of God being here, there is a response that's necessary, repenting and believing. And so you'll see here, we could also go to Matthew 7 and look at how Jesus talks about responding to this kingdom of God. Matthew 7 is the conclusion of the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, but what's important here to know is that in responding, uh, in repenting and believing in these special moments of time when good news is announced, is that it creates a gap. Now, at our church, we talk about this as the discipleship gap, that when you are able to acknowledge and experience that good news is breaking in, when you're able to ask this question, what is God saying to me in this good news? And then responding, how will, how will I obey God in this good news? It diverts the course of your life. So for some of you that are here live, you put in the chat box a couple of times, things, times, life that were special where you heard good news, the birth of children, grandchildren, jobs, uh, things that happened that came into your life, new things that happened that came into your life what you will start to notice about these good news moments is that if they're truly good news, they divert your life into a different direction. And so maybe a couple of ways you can think about this today, a couple of points here is that what we're being called into as citizens in the kingdom of God here is to turn towards the kingdom and live a transformed life. Oftentimes in America and the West, we kind of have this smaller myopic view that what we're being called to is a church, right? We're being called into the ecclesia or we're being called out as the people of God. We're being called to church. And yeah, yeah, we are. We're called to doing life with one another as the body of believers. Yes, that's true. But I want to notice, I just want to stop and reflect in this moment that when Jesus announces the good news, the good news is not that the church is here, right? The good news is that the time has come and the kingdom of God is near. And so we're called to repent and believe. We're called towards the kingdom and to live a transformed life. That's bigger than the church. And so as we're turning towards the kingdom, we also have to turn away from the empire and the way it calls us to live. Here, literally, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is calling these first disciples away from the way they were living. He said, you were fishers before you're in a boat fishing. I'm actually going to make you fishers of men. He's not just calling them away from a job, he's calling them away from an identity, their vocation, their purpose was doing this one thing, but if they're going to follow Jesus, it's going to be this not just entirely new thing, but transformed thing. You see that? He's going to make them fishers still, yes, but fishers of men. He's transforming them through their response. But he's also not just calling them away from their jobs and their identities as fishers. In that context, he's actually calling them away from their family. They're leaving their father. They're leaving what they know behind for this new family, this new way of living. And that's as citizens in the kingdom of God. And that's going to require their full attention. And so then maybe that takes us to our third and kind of final bullet point. If you're a note taker type, uh, kingdom citizenship will always require attention to and service for the least of these. Now, we could go to Matthew and, and talk about that Sermon on the Mount and notice maybe, observe maybe, that he opens Jesus with the Beatitudes, that is the blessings, and he's saying who is blessed in this kingdom. If we're going to live this kingdom way, 
here is who is blessed. And we could spend a lot of time with that. I could do a whole sermon on that. But I really just want to focus in on Mark because that's where we are. And look at 17. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. The following of Jesus isn't just for our own sake. Yes, we are individually following Jesus, and that's what he's calling us to, but it's in the service of others. Being in the kingdom of God is maybe importantly so in the service of others. And, and maybe importantly, we could say it this way, the call to follow Jesus and follow Jesus well is requiring us to give attention to others. And maybe you grew up in a tradition like I did where that was not maybe the focus. Maybe that focus was a little anemic. Following Jesus was about my sins, yes, and giving my life over to Jesus, yes, and then just trying to follow some rules and wait things out until Jesus comes back. But I, I just want to notice here in Scripture, and we're going to focus on Scripture. This isn't about what Marcus says. It's about what Jesus is saying here. I will make you fishers of men. It's not primarily about our own individual self. It's about others. And so this citizenship in the kingdom requires our attention to and service for the least of these, for others. And so I just want to leave you here with that thought as you go into your breakout groups. I know that we're at 1220. Uh, that's perfect. We're going to give you 30 minutes. Jamie's going to send you out to breakout groups momentarily. We'll come back at 1250. But I want those three points to really color your conversation about the chapters on citizenship and attention because it's how Jesus frames and starts his ministry. This is the good news. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Come follow me so that I can make you fishers of men so that you can respond in a way that is helpful for others. So that's what we have. We'll go, Jamie, if you can send our friends to breakout groups, we're going to come back at 1250. We'll debrief some, uh, uh, allow some of you to come off of mute to share. And then we'll talk about next week in our last steps for this season. Right. Well, we have a little bit of time. So, yeah, please feel free to put in the chat box and we'll start calling some folks off uh, mute. Uh, what stood out to you today from your conversation, from Deborah's reflections on citizenship uh, or moving from passivity to citizenship and moving from indifference to attention or maybe something from the Mark passage and now you're going to be a fisher of people or a gardener of people or wh whatever it is uh, that's being transformed in your life. What, what stood out to you today? You can start in the chat box and we'll get a couple of folks off of mute here. Yeah, Brad put in here, sharing with us, starting us off in John 3, 16, very familiar, for God so loved the cosmos. Uh, oh, that's different. I, that You zigged where I thought you were going to zag, Fred. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. So not for God so loved the world, but he so loved the cosmos. Talk to us about that. Yeah, Rick uh, Gasway pointed this out, and I, I remember it. Uh, the word used there is cosmos, actually, for God so loved and then sometimes that's used for world, but sometimes it's used for more. But the significance is it's not just God so loved people. Um, so everything's everything's a part of this. Uh, we, yeah. we, we discussed this in our, our small group Bible study, and one of the other people didn't, hadn't heard that. So I said, well, why don't more people talk about that? And I said, well, actually, I'm writing a book on that. So another fellow in our group that knew that I was said, so... Uh, do you want the short answer or the 400 page answer? <laughs> there you go. I love it. Well, we'll take both in. Who knows? Maybe when you're done, it'll be a season of the Beth Bond Memorial Book Club, and we'll have you talking uh, about that. So that uh, thanks for that insight. I, I bet that was a really good discussion there. But yeah, uh, just the idea of how even in our minds, if we're not careful and we're not intentional, 
we can narrow the scope of what God is doing, right? We put God in boxes. Um, our language doesn't always help us, but maybe more so our hearts. Because, yeah, even reading For God So Loved the World will make that about people. Like, people is what God is saying. And it's like, no, like, that's not the language. So thanks for sharing that. Others, what what stood out to you from your discussion today or your conversation or your reflection and reading wrestling with what Deborah has here for us. So give you a few moments, or if you just want to come off of mute and share, you're welcome to do that as well. You don't have to type it in. Go ahead, David. Well, uh, in our group, we spend a lot of time talking about citizenship. And uh, I, I heard really very interesting ideas. Uh, one, that uh, I think John was making the point about the um, culture that we have and how more so in the United States, the, uh, the culture about the individual, we're a very individualistic society. And we were talking about how difficult it is to, to understand the concept of community, you know, the, the we, the we are in this together kind of uh, idea, right? Yeah, yeah. Barry, that... Barry, Barry or John, John or Jean, Janet, if you want to add something. Please, yeah, anyone want to add to that from that conversation or their reflection on that conversation? Yeah, I was just, uh, John gave us a lot to think about, about um, the idea of humans being designed for for community and relationship, and uh, I guess ultimately citizenship. Um, and, uh, and David also um, talked about the importance of language and how we have to really um, pay attention to the barriers that the language that we use sometimes creates um, in terms of communicating these these ideas yeah that's good that's so good um so many different places to, to go off there in, in past rabbit holes to maybe chase down um a, a few that just kind of strike me though in that conversation uh, one is just a, a teaching technique usually when i'm meeting with evangelicals and we're looking at uh something that paul has written so uh some of the epistles or letters I just regularly, because I'm in the South, just say y'all instead of you there uh, to help kind of reframe into that community. So a lot of times people say, yeah, Paul says you have to do this. And I was like, no, nah, he's actually saying y'all, like y'all, y'all got to do that. You, you collective group of folks need to do that. And so I, I have found that to be very helpful. But uh, just that idea of language. And so in, we looked at Mark today and a little bit of Matthew, but in Acts, this was something that was shared with me that was helpful in reframing. Um, so if you look in Genesis and the Tower of Babylon story there, or Babel, um, you see the not just scattering of the peoples, but the languages and kind of what that does in, in rupturing relationships between y'all, us, people. And then in the, uh, in the story in Acts at Pentecost, where you see the people coming back and the Holy Spirit being poured out, that they're all able to understand and hear in their own language and kind of this reversing of Babel in some very important ways that language is no longer going to be a barrier to unity and community of the people. And then ultimately in Revelation, you kind of see the, the ultimate expression of this, where it's all nations tribes and tongues, right? Uh, that kind of ultimate fulfillment of that that you see in Revelation is not that there's a uniformity of the nations, the tribes, and the tongues that in their diversity, they're going to be there worshiping God. And, and that's kind of that reverse picture of community that I love. So um, with that, we have a couple minutes. Uh, be thinking, and you'll get this in email later as well, uh, be thinking of questions you have for Deborah, and if you want to send those to me ahead of time, uh, if it's a particularly naughty question or, 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 you know, thorny question that you want her to be thinking of ahead of time, you can email those to me. I'll get them to her ahead of time, but also we're just going to spend time with her like this, just in conversation. So no breakout groups, one big group, we'll talk with her. Uh, next week will be our last week of book club with you with us live or joining virtually. 
We'll have a film. Our film festival is happening in April. I'll have more details for that down the line. Um, and then alongside the film festival, there's some summer of action stuff. But one quick note, you're hearing this first. You're literally the first people to hear this. Uh, book club in the fall, we're going to move it to the evening. So we're going to change our rhythm a little bit uh, because while lunchtime is a great time for a lot of folks, especially in the East and Central time to gather, uh, the evening opens up a little bit more flexibility for more people. And importantly, what we're going to try to do is you can join us like this, how you are now, and be a part of a breakout group. But we're going to invite folks to gather in threes or fours, wherever they are, do the first part like we do together. And then instead of going into a breakout room, you just gather with the two or three or four folks that are there with you. So um, Diane's been in one of those rooms with me live before where we've been together in a group with three or four people. Uh, and so we're going to try that in the fall. So just so you know that you're hearing it here first, we are going to do book club again. We are going to shift it into the evening window frame. And the invitation there is for you to join us either as you are now or have three or four people in your living room or at your church or your congregation, your community gather together. And then that be your breakout group. And then we come back. So um, with that, I'm going to pray us out uh, here and then we will move into the rest of our weeks. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this conversation. And we just ask that it be glorifying to you, that what's from you and your Holy Spirit and what glorifies your son, Jesus, the Christ, uh, let that stick. And what doesn't, Lord, what's not from those things, we ask that it just fall away. Uh, and we do all this in the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Bye.